verse 66, Luke 22. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. From now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, you say that I am. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. And the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priest and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying he, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priest and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priest and the rulers of the people. And he said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look. Nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. And he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. Well, Jesus is in custody. He has been unjustly arrested and is now being subjected to both physical abuse and spiritual blasphemy. Now, you may be new to the term blasphemy. I think it's important that we understand it correctly. Blasphemy is to intentionally and irreverently profane and slander God. And verse 65 of chapter 22 says that they said many things against him, blaspheming him. They are intentionally and irreverently profaning and slandering Jesus, the Son of God. The irony about this is that 
Blasphemy is the very reason the Jewish council has taken Jesus into custody. Their accusation is that he blasphemed God. Yet, these religious leaders are the very ones who are guilty of true blasphemy. Remember, in this true crime documentary, Luke is our courtroom reporter. And in this section of his report, he wants us to determine for ourselves who the real blasphemer is. Is it Jesus or is it those who oppose Jesus? The answer to that lies at the heart of the question Jesus is being asked while he is in custody of the Jewish council. And the question that he's being asked is, are you the Christ? Are you the Christ? The most important question in all of life, the question that all of us must answer, is Jesus the Christ? Christ is not the last name of Jesus, in the way we think about the cultural usages of our names. I am Jonathan, not the Blankenship. I am Jonathan Blankenship. If you want to get a kick out of the fullness of that name, ask Jaden before you leave today what his name is. And you'll never hear Blankenship used the way that Jaden uses it. My three-year-old. Christ is... Not the same way we use our cultural last names. Christ is a title, like Messiah, which means God's anointed one. So when you see the, the identity of Christ here, it's the formal and sacred title for the Savior that God promised to send. Now understand this. All Jews believe that God promised to send the Christ it was, it was not unbelief in a Christ that's at issue here. No, the issue is that this Jewish council refuses to believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ whom God has sent. So here's their agenda. They're going to intentionally hold a sham trial, often called a kangaroo court, to manipulate what they've already decided to do to Jesus, which is murder him. They want to murder him. Not because he had committed any crimes, but because he was not who they wanted the Christ to be. And that is especially since he, on many occasions over the last three and a half years of his earthly ministry, exposed over and over again the evil and hypocrisy of their hearts. They wanted him gone without any legitimate accusation. They had already determined he is to die. So this whole arrest and midnight trial was a complete sham. We don't have time to go into all the nuances of it, but so much of what they did here was against their own law. For example, they were never allowed by Jewish custom and law to have this kind of a trial during Passover, and here they are doing it at night, which was also prohibited, without a defense, which was also prohibited. I mean, there were so many issues here, but finally, finally, after several conspiratorial acts, this Jewish legal body known as the Sanhedrin decided that they would convict Jesus on the charge of blasphemy. And they do so by having him acknowledge that he was the Christ. That's verse 66. They led him away to their council, the Sanhedrin, and they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. If you are the Christ. Let me, let, me, let me just make it clear this morning. There are no ifs about it. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Christ. And that evidence has been clear. 
You can look at it from the perspective of the angelic announcement in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Simeon, when he held Jesus there in the temple, Luke 2, 26, he says, I have seen the Lord's Christ. In Luke chapter 4, demons, demons came saying, you are the Son of God because they knew that he was the Christ. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 20, Jesus said to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, Christ. Yet here we are as Jesus stands before this Jewish council and they're asking him, are you the Christ? Well, let's stop for a moment and ask ourselves, our own hearts, is Jesus the Christ? Is he the anointed one of God? Am I convinced in my own heart that Jesus is the only Savior for sinners? Luke doesn't want there to be any doubt. So in reporting this part of the story in the killing of Jesus, he helps us affirm three indispensable convictions that Jesus indeed is the Christ. There are many Others that we could bring together in the whole of the scriptures. But three Luke directs our attention to. Here's the first one. He says to us that he is Christ, our incarnate God. He is Christ, our incarnate God. Well, at first, Jesus doesn't directly answer their question when he is asked of the Jewish council, Are you the Christ? Instead, he says in verse 69, from now on, or another way to say that is after this, after what's fixing to transpire, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. In that statement, Jesus reminds them about his human nature. He tells them that he is the Son of Man. It's one of his favorite titles. Yet that title doesn't speak of just human nature alone. It's a title that Daniel used in his own prophecy regarding the deity of the Son of Man. In Daniel chapter 7 in verses 13 and 14, here's what Daniel wrote in his God-given prophetic vision. Daniel said, I saw in the night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion, Daniel says, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. All the Jews understand Daniel's prophecy. And so... By Jesus declaring himself to be the son of man in the same way that Daniel used it in Daniel chapter 7, he is identifying what Daniel was identifying, that the son of man is God himself. So in light of that prophecy and by Jesus' answer, that after this, the son of man will be seated on the right hand of the power of God, Jesus is saying, yes, yes. You want to know if I'm the Christ? I am the Christ, the incarnate God. And when this hour of darkness is finished, I'm returning to my place of glory in heaven. Now again, the council knew exactly what he was saying, but they decided to double down and ensure that they had him on the record claiming to be God so that in their hearts of unbelief, they might charge him with blasphemy. So they said in verse 70, are you the son of God then? And he said to them, I am as you say. Their response is pretty clear. What else do we need? He's admitted it. He's telling us he's God, the Christ. What else 
Do we need to charge him and to kill him? But let me, let me ask us for just a moment. What else do we need? By his own lips, Jesus identifies himself as the Christ, our incarnate God. What else do we need? The scripture makes it clear in John chapter 1 that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, for in him, in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. 1 John 4, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is the Christ is not from God. That spirit is the spirit of Antichrist. By his own lips, he tells us who he is, that he is Christ, our incarnate God. But that Jewish council, they would have none of it. And the truth of the matter is, they could never plead ignorance about his true identity. He told them, and he showed them plainly over and over again who he was, and yet their hearts were hardened to unbelief because of prejudice, blindness, and evil hypocrisy. The same is true for so many in this room who continue to reject that Jesus is the Christ. You cannot plead ignorance. He has shown you over and over again that he is the incarnate God. What more do you need? Is Jesus the Christ? Yes. Luke says, I want you to see here, he is Christ, our incarnate God. He is also, secondly, Christ, our sinless king. Christ, our sinless king. Well, the Jewish council has what they need, so they proceed to take Jesus to Pilate on the charges that they have brought against him. Now, the reason they're doing this is that this was required for the Jews. Remember, the Jews were under Roman authority, and by Roman law, all sentences of Jewish death had to be approved by the Romans. So so the Sanhedrin and the Jewish council, the Romans allowed them to continue to operate by the law of God. But then when it came to these more significant matters, they could not proceed further unless Rome allowed them to. So they take Jesus to their Roman governor, Pilate. And it's here we see some of the details of this sham trial. Verse 23 says they began to accuse Jesus before Pilate. But if you look closer here, you'll you'll discover that everything they're accusing him of, it's, it's, it's all lies. It's all lies. He forbade them to give taxes to Caesar. That was a lie. That never happened. Him misleading the people to overthrow Rome, that was a lie. That, that never happened. And the reason why they're doing this is because the Romans didn't care about the Jewish charge, which is blasphemy. To to them, blasphemy was no crime at all. They were accustomed to it themselves. So to get Pilate to take this seriously, they had to accuse Jesus of being more than a blasphemer. They had to accuse him, in this case, of being an insurrectionist, particularly an insurrectionist against Roman authority. Essentially, they're accusing him before Pilate as being a terrorist. They accuse him of misleading their people when the truth of the matter is they are the ones who are misleading Pilate. It's nothing but lies, deception, and slander. 
Can I just stop right here and remind us that slander, deception, and false accusations are the three favorite strategies of Satan? Jesus said of Satan in John chapter 8 and verse 44 that he is the father of all lies. It's his favorite strategy. Slander, lies, deception, false accusations, those are his favorite tools. And it's a good time when we see things like this to stop and remind ourselves that we are never more like the devil than when we slander, deceive, and falsely accuse others. This counsel who's supposed to be a counsel identified under the banner of God is actually a counsel who is spitting out lie after lie after lie. But Pilate is no fool. He observes and makes his ruling clear. Verse 4 of chapter 23, he says, I find no guilt in this man. And some translations say, I find no fault in this man. Essentially, he's saying, he hasn't done anything wrong. But the council, they were relentless. They were pushing him to do something. So Pilate does. Don't get mad at me. Pilate does what most government agencies do. He gives them the runaround. He discovers that Jesus is a Galilean, and he says, hey, I don't want to deal with this. He's actually from Galilee under Herod's jurisdiction, so take him to Herod. Let, let him decide what to do with him, and so they do. And after some time with Herod, which involved a level of mockery and abuse by Herod's soldiers. Herod then decides, I, I, I don't want to deal with this. So he descends him back to Pilate because neither Herod nor his soldiers or anyone else in, in his cabinet could find anything wrong in Jesus. So he comes back to Pilate, and Pilate makes it clear to the Jewish council, verse 14 of chapter 23, after examining him before you, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges. It's the second time he says it. Neither did Herod. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by Jesus. But to get Jesus out of his hands and the Jews out of his home, Pilate at least commits to physically abusing him, scourging him, in hopes that that would be sufficient for the Jewish council. But these men are so filled with vehement hatred that they will not back down unless Jesus dies. So verse 18 of chapter 23 says, They all cried together, Away with this man! And they kept shouting, crucify, crucify, crucify him. Again, if they can get Pilate to view Jesus as an insurrectionist against the Roman government by his claims to be a king, then according to Roman law, that would merit death by crucifixion. It's interesting the Jewish council had convicted him on the basis that he claimed to be God. Now they're seeking to get the Romans to convict him on the basis of claiming to be a king. But Pilate could read into their evil lies. Jesus was no threat to Rome in the way that the Jews were accusing him. So for the third time, the third time, Time, Pilate says in verse 22, why? Why do you want him crucified? Why do you want him sentenced to death? What evil has he done? I find in him no guilt. Friends, Jesus 
is Christ, the sinless king. In Genesis, it says that the scepter of kingship will not depart from him. In 2 Samuel 7, it says his throne is established forever. In Psalm 2, it says that Jesus is the king of Zion. Isaiah 9, it tells us that all governments, including this one, are under his authority and that he will rule with justice and righteousness forever. In Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men came looking for him at his birth, they said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? When the angel Gabriel told Mary in Luke 1 that she was pregnant with child, he identified to her that this child was like no other, for this child will reign over Israel forever, and his kingdom will never have an end. Jesus himself said in John's gospel, chapter 18, my kingdom is not of this world. And John, in the vision of Jesus in the book of Revelation, Revelation 19, shows us Jesus sitting on the heavenly throne with the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords written above him. Why? Because Jesus is Christ the King. And we need to remember that this week. He's a king like no earth this earth has never known. Why? Because he's a sinless king. The Jewish council may have attempted to manipulate guilt in him, but there was no guilt in him. Because not only were they accusing a perfectly innocent man, they were accusing the perfectly sinless God. Not one verse of scripture, not one, even hints at Jesus coming close to committing sin. In fact, it's the opposite. Second Corinthians 5, he knew no sin. First Peter 1, he was without blemish or spot. First Peter 2, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Hebrews 4, he was tempted like us, yet without sin. First John chapter 3, in him, in Jesus, there is no sin. Jesus is Christ, our sinless King. The verse 23 of our text says that the Jewish council, they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And here's, here's a phrase, if you want to note it there in your Bibles, that I've been intrigued by this week. It comes at the end of verse 23. It says that their voices prevailed. Think about it for a moment. The Jewish council, they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, but their voices, their voices prevailed. So, obviously, Pilate caves under the pressure that, in his opinion, a riot is most likely imminent if he doesn't give over to their will. So, their voices prevail. It's a unique observation. I think of times in our lives when the pressure is on that we allow the wrong voices or Siri or (laughs) Alexa. No, no, honestly, there are times in our life when the pressure is on that we allow the wrong voices to dictate our thoughts and actions. Their voices prevailed in Pilate's heart. Their voices. Oh, brothers and sisters, listen to me. Do not allow the wrong voices to prevail in your life today. I'm talking about the voices of irrational and false Thinking. Allow the voices of truth to prevail. That wasn't the case for Pilate. He gave in to the will of the people. He listened to their voice. He granted their demand. Which leads me to the third and final affirmation about Jesus being Christ that Luke lays out for us. Luke says, he is Christ, our incarnate God. He is Christ, our sinless king. And number three, he is Christ, our righteous substitute. 
The Jews demanded Jesus to be crucified. And they demanded a man by the name of Barabbas to be released. This is actually a very unique request compared to our modern system of justice, but not so for their particular culture. Uh, to understand that, there was, a, there was a custom, a Jewish custom during Passover that the Roman governor would set a prisoner free, which, which many historians believe that their whole custom of doing so was a symbol of what they were celebrating in Passover. God releasing Israel from the bondage and imprisonment of Egypt. So as a further sign and symbol of what God had done for them, they would have this custom of releasing at least one prisoner to show what God had done in their own bondage. It was a gift of mercy in the same way that they, as a People historically had been shown mercy. I'm sure Pilate was thinking about this custom as he dealt with their issues with Jesus and most likely in his own heart hoped that they would choose Jesus to be released. But not so. Their hatred for Jesus was so vehemently strong that they, choose, they chose rather to have a proven insurrectionist and a convicted murderer to be put back on the streets so that they could have Jesus, an innocent man, put to death. Now, in my opinion, this is the height of hypocrisy for the Jews. They accuse Jesus, listen, of being an insurrectionist who cannot be trusted with life in their society while at the same time demanding that a convicted insurrectionist and murderer be set free to once again live in their society. If you think politics are crazy now, you just don't understand. It's been crazy for a long time. So Pilate, in verse 25, released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one for whom they asked, Barabbas. But notice this phrase. He delivered Jesus over to their will. So whose will was done. The will of the Jews or the will of God? Both. The will of the Jews was to destroy, right? But the will of the Father was to was to save. And I know this may sound very strange to say, but please hear me out and do not post any clips of this statement alone for my, to be targeted by this week. This is how the mystery of God's purpose often works. Because at this point, both Satan's plan and God's plan were working toward the same end. The death of Jesus by Crucifixion. Different purposes, of course, but the same plan of action. Michael Wilcock, in his comments on this, said, two plans converge at Calvary, but the difference between them is all important. And men must choose on whose side they will be, either the beneficiaries of the plan by which God brought Jesus to the cross or the accomplices of the plan by which Satan brought him there. Now, Satan didn't know it because Satan's not omniscient. But his plan was working right into the plan of God. And what is God's plan? To save and redeem sinners. And for God's people to be saved and redeemed, Christ had to become a substitute for them in death 
by crucifixion, for it was the only means whereby this redemption could be offered. Acts 2.23, we've quoted it on many times in this brief little series. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. This was God's will. But at the same time, he says to the Jewish people, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You see, this had to happen. The death of Christ would be the deliverance of God's people and substitution was the only way to do it. It makes absolute sense to me that in the unfolding of this drama, a sinner was released from death so that the righteous could be put to death. It's exactly the picture of the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, which is key to us understanding the glory of our salvation. Christ in my place. If you could respond to the gospel in one simple phrase, somebody asks you, what's the gospel? Here's the gospel. Christ in my place. He, was, he has borne our griefs, Isaiah says. He's carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was cruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. 2 Corinthians 5, for our sake, our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. Galatians says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 1 Peter 3, for Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. This is the only way sinners are redeemed, is if God, the incarnate one, the sinless one, becomes the substitute. You see, Barabbas doesn't stand before us merely as an individual, just another person in the drama. He actually represents sinners. Has fallen from God and in a state of rebellion against him, bound in chains, imprisoned by the curse of the law until Christ took their place. Now that doesn't mean that Barabbas ever came to faith in Jesus. We, we don't know that. The point, rather, is that Jesus is the Christ who became our righteous substitute, pardoning sinners who were dead in their sins, doomed to die, but by God's grace have been freed from sin on the account that Christ took my place. And here's the good news of the gospel this morning. The gospel of grace comes to those who are even on death row. And it declares to us that there is a Christ, a Savior who has taken our death, and as a result, we can be freed from the crime if we trust in Him. The question for today is Jesus the Christ. And what will you do with your answer? Will you believe that he is Christ, the incarnate God, the sinless king, and your righteous substitute? Or will you say with the rest of the Jewish council, away with him. Away with him from my life, from my mind, away from him. First response, which is a response of faith, is what frees us from our sins. The second response, however, is one of unbelief. And to choose a way with Jesus is to be doomed to eternal death. Whichever one it is for us, whether 
we are freed from sins or doomed to eternal death. It all is determined by whether or not we will believe that Jesus is the Christ. Oh, it is our deepest prayer today that you will see Jesus the way so many of us have. Jesus, the Christ, our incarnate God. Jesus, the Christ, our sinless King. Jesus, the Christ, our righteous substitute. And he says, any who will come to him believing and receiving him as Christ, he will not turn away. The government may give you a runaround. But Jesus says, come. All you who are weary and heavy laden, come. And I will give you rest. Let's stand together for prayer.